Chris Herndon, David Herndon, um, Dr. Cunningham, Dr. Brazier for uh, participating, uh, for agreeing both to uh, plan uh, uh, this workshop and also uh, participate in it. Uh, they say that if you want to get something done, ask a busy person. And that's uh, really been uh, my experience uh, all through academic medicine. Uh, there are people who, when you ask them to do something, will say something like, oh my God, I've got to talk, you know, for the medical students coming out in 27 days, and I'm just consumed by it. Um, and then there are people uh, like the Center and Institute directors uh, at UTMB, all of them actually, uh, who are just uh, incredibly busy uh, scurrying around trying to get uh, funding for all the people uh, that they work with, um, collaborating on grants, writing grants and stuff like that. But when you ask them to do things, they say fine. So I uh, am greatly appreciative. It's one of the nicest things of being VP for research. And VP for research is actually quite a sucky job. But, uh, but, but, but dealing with the Center and Institute Directors is, is really uh, one of the uh, fun things about it. So this is part of a, a, a series of uh, things we're trying to do in, in the uh, research office to uh, help establish investigators. Now you may say, well, well, what about new investigators? Okay, but all the structures of academic uh, health centers pretty much over the past 30 years or so, as long as I've been involved, have really been set to help new investigators. And we certainly are going to continue all of them. Uh, in fact, we're uh, with the Academy of Research Matters and, and other uh, uh, types of uh, activities, we're, tr we're trying to enhance them. But I really do think that there has been an opinion that you know once you get your second R01 or once you hit age 45 and you do whatever, you know it all. You know, uh, you're supposed to teach other people, you're not supposed to learn anymore. And, and that's, of course, crazy, uh, totally crazy. Uh, and so uh, we need more structures to, uh, to formally being instructing ourselves and helping each other uh, as established investigators. Um, some of the other activities are that grant review. Just a reminder, we do external grant reviews for anyone who needs it. We're going to have a, another workshop on um, commercialization, I guess, small business. And then there's going to be a new pilot program coming out sometime in the next month or so on um, our commercialization ideas. Not necessarily small business, but just anything with commercializable. So we're trying. Um, the format of, these, of this workshop um, I'm going to give an introduction, which I just did, um, and I have a slide on uh, how to develop a theme. Uh, I actually had several, but I got rid of them because a lot of the other speakers are dealing with them and their slides seemed nicer than mine. Um, then um, we're going to be going uh, the way that uh, shows that Dr. Herndon is going to talk about leadership. Uh, Brazier is going to be talking about uh, forming a team. Uh, uh, Catherine Cunningham talking about both about timeline and cultivating relationship. And if we have time, uh, Dr. Herndon will talk a little about budget too, right? And uh, did you give your slides to Kelly yet? They're on the computer. They're, that's good. That's good. I hope. Okay, good. Um, the format is uh, we're, we're, we've asked ourselves to uh, sort of go through the topic. Uh, then if others of us, uh, you know, want to chip in some of our, you know, personal opinions on something, we do that. And then uh, the audience uh, can chip in uh, also. And that happens at the end of each presentation. Not mine, because I'm giving an introduction and uh, a lot of what I say will be covered in more depth by the other speakers. But the other speakers are more topic derived and therefore the questions will come at the end of that. And I'll be the timekeeper so that I'll make sure we end on time uh, if conversations go uh, too long. I think uh, if I had a, a recommendation, uh, one should listen for commonalities. We all have our idiosyncratic ways of writing grants or how we get funding. Uh, but if you hear the commonalities uh, among uh, two or three speakers, then you know there must be something there. That's another way of saying we're going to repeat ourselves a lot. <laughs> um, I thought it was funny. Okay, so 
Um, here is a list of most of the active multi-component uh, awards at UTMB uh, uh, today. I know I missed some. I apologize. Um, um, and they're not in any uh, uh, actual order, does that? Yeah. So, um, for example, uh, Dr. Cunningham has a P20, which is kind of like a, a starter center grant. She's also got a, a P50, which is a big center grant that, that uh, has uh, projects as well as cores, uh, very similar to a PPG, except it's a center grant. And I think uh, Dr. Herndon has a slide uh, going through these things. Um, there are uh, P30s, which are uh, just cores, but once again, they're center grants and they, they have a theme. Uh, there are contracts like U19s. Uh, the speakers today, by the way, Dr. Herndon has a PPG and a P50, and plus he runs the Shriners, and he's had others in the past. Uh, Dr. Cunningham has a P20 and a P30. Uh, Dr. Brazier's had PPGs, I think he still does, and uh, program and, and U19s and, uh, and of, of the CTSA. So the speakers you're going to hear from are, are very experienced in this, um, in this area. But we don't have many. And then if you look at the uh, directors, the PIs, um, once again, it's kind of a commonality. What do these people have in common? Now, I don't know all these people super well, but I know most of them super well. Uh, and what I would say is um, they're all ambitious. They all have a driving ambition. They may be nice, but underneath, they've got strong ambition uh, to succeed uh, and to build. They're obviously all bright and hardworking. And uh, the other thing is they're not afraid to fail. Um, which is just absolutely key uh, in uh, research, that you cannot be afraid to fail. And that's, the, the fear of failure is a very, very common phenomenon, particularly among some of our uh, uh, junior colleagues. Uh, and you should celebrate your failures. You should put them up there, you know, just to get rid of the phobia. It's sort of like whatever that training is in behavioral medicine, where you just sort of talk about your failure every day. Pretty soon it won't be uh, quite as uh, uh, scary a thing. So why go after multi-component grant? Money uh, would be one. Uh, and money, uh, typically a multi-component grant tends to have infrastructure. So that means you get an administrator, okay? Or at least you get half of an administrator. You know, you don't get those things at UTMB anymore, particularly if you're doing research. Uh, and so, you know, you get, you get people to help you uh, uh, organize uh, things. You uh, often, uh, multi-component grants will have specific funds for junior faculty. They'll have training grants, that, or, you know, training components, uh, uh, a K-12 component or, or, or something like that for junior faculty. They'll have money for pilot grants frequently, which can be very uh, uh, helpful too, uh, and for other neat stuff. You also get some respect for your institution. This isn't a quid pro quo. Uh, and if you try to make it a quid pro quo, um, it, it, it won't necessarily work. Sometimes it will. Like, in other words, you go to the provost and say, I'm putting this in, but I need this amount of institutional support in order to make it look good in the study section. Sometimes that'll work. But even if it doesn't work, uh, people are more likely to answer your emails and, you know, smile at you in the hall and things like that. Become, you become an important person, not just, you know, to the campus in general, but certainly to the people who are part of your a uh, big multi-component grant. Y it leads to new interesting uh, collaborations. Writing or participating in a multi-component grant is a really nice way to grow. If you're feeling stale, get into one. It's just a really nice way. You know, for those of you in basic work who says, how do I ever get into uh, translational? You know, get into one of these multi-components. So it, it just, it just it makes you start interacting uh, every day with, uh, with different types of people in different disciplines. And even unsuccessful applications um, uh, contribute to uh, new funding, in, in my experience, a lot of the time. Uh, an RO1 will come out of it that'll get funded or something like that, and new collaborations. So here are some, here are some uh, funding rates. Uh, here's a real good reason to, uh, and I, I, this is obviously not all institutes, uh, but this is with some selected ones, and across the top, 
you see uh, the funding rates for R01s in 2013. So most of them were, you know, around 14, 15 percent. Uh, with I Institute, for those of you out there who, <laughs> you know, quite a bit higher, might think of switching your field. Um, but then, for all of these institutes, the program project uh, uh, funding uh, rates were um, rather impressively higher than for the uh, R01. Now, you know, program project, you have to get approval to. Uh, to submit it, so it's a hard slog, but uh, this is, you know, this is great. And then you start looking at these centers, now some of these institutes don't have all these centers, but, this, but the center funding, the rate of center funding is fantastic. Uh, you know, just showing up, uh, typically you're at a 30 to 40 percent chance of getting funded. So uh, that's another reason to uh, think about uh, uh, center funding. Now it isn't easy, in fact it's incredibly <laughs> difficult as everyone will tell you, but you know the funding rates are, uh, are pretty good. So uh, in my long time as VP for research I've seen two, no actually in my life I've seen sort of two uh, trajectories. One is the loser trajectory, all right? The announcement comes out and I get an email copying about 17 other people saying we should respond to this. Okay, we should respond to this. Now, if I fire an email back immediately saying who wants to be PI and I don't get any response, then I forget it. I don't even read the rest of the emails, okay? Because that means there's no one out there with burning ambition who wants to take it and do it. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, maybe there's no one out there and that's entirely appropriate that there's no one out there, that no one senses they can put together the right vision or theme or whatever. But it's a waste of time. The winning trajectory, and Catherine is going to talk about how this uh, in her timeline, is you start with, and, and also uh, David, I think, you know, you start with a strong ambition, a strong leader with ambition to get a center grant or to do something like that or put a program project together. Uh, that person uh, accumulates other senior mid-level uh, investigators. Um, and I know I keep on saying senior and mid-level and those of you who are younger may feel kind of dissed. Um, but you know, it, it is actually true you do get, you tend to get a little better as you get older. I mean, not always. Um, one of my wife's uh, favorite jokes is, you know, what's the difference between men and, and, and treasury bonds? Uh, bonds mature. Um, but, um, but actually, everyone is capable of maturing. There, there, are, there are fewer adolescents at age 40 than at age 30. And there are fewer adolescents at age 50 than there are at age 40, with some real obvious exceptions, okay, but, but that we could all come up with, you know, even here at UTMB, but even in this room, but, but, um, but it's true, okay. And so, you know, as you get older, you get a little better at sharing, you get a little better at not making it all about you. Uh, and that's going to be important in putting together uh, a center grant. So that's why I talk about senior. But certainly, it's a wonderful place uh, for junior investigators uh, uh, to get involved. So the winning trajectory is to go through these first three steps and then to ask the question, is it a good fit? There's a line from Neil Young, if you follow every dream, you may get lost. Not a real romantic line, okay, but very pragmatic. You can't sort of go off on every tangent and say, oh, this may be good and, and, and look and all that. At, at a very early point, you have to say, is this for us or not, yes or no? Even if you say yes, you may say no later on, but, but the, the point is to say no early on. Uh, and so is this a good fit? Can we craft a good theme? Will it work? And so <clears throat> my final slide uh, is just, just a couple of ideas about a theme. Um, a theme to me for a center grant and a program project uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, it, I don't know that it is for everyone, but for me, I have to have a theme. I have to have a coherent theme that I can express in a sentence or two, and it has to sing. It just has to be like, damn, that's wonderful. Standing ovation type of thing. Um, and then I can craft the rest 
uh, of the uh, uh, center around it. The threats to, the great, to, to having a great theme is if you start with what you want as opposed to start with what's a good theme. Uh, I sacrifice everything to the theme. So, I mean, I have been PI of a P60, which I didn't even know existed before I got one, which is very similar to a P50. Uh, so I've been, I've been PI of a P60, a P50, a P30, uh, an R24, a secret multi-center grant, and something else, a multi-center grant to be named at a later date. And on all but one of them, I did not have a project, even though I was PI. I didn't have a project in any of those grants. Why? Because it fell out, because it didn't fit. You know, once we got the theme and it was like, that's it, you know, everything else was secondary to that theme. If it didn't fit, sorry, you're out. Uh, which made it a lot easier for me to, to say that to other people because I just said it uh, to myself. So to the extent that you can get that and you'll know it when you see it, uh, it's a wonderful way to, uh, to craft a grant. I think there are other ways to do it where you don't necessarily uh, I'll start with the theme, but if you start with, uh, you know, well, God, we got to get something for Martha, you know, and what do I want? You know, it, it's, it's just going to, it's going to make it more uh, complex. Um, the, you know, my favorite example is the Pepper Center. The theme just sang. It was aging muscle, you know, and we had this one sentence that Elena still uses in her renewals now, you know, is, uh, we study one tissue muscle, a striatal muscle. We study uh, one, one uh, species, humans. We study one condition, aging. And, 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 and Bob Wolf, who um, Dave and I would at least agree probably was you know, one of the greatest investigators ever to be at UTMB, very creative, uh, uh, put a diagram for that where uh, he could put everything that we did in the Pepper Center, everything that we were going to do in that first five years, he put it on one diagram. And he said, there's Volpe, you know, and there's Ottenbacher, and here's, you know, Wolf. It was just beautiful, so it was the theme. So to the extent that you can get that, um, it will be great. So I will, I think you're next, right? And David is going to, Dr. Uh, Dr. David is going to talk about uh, leadership. Thank you very much. I, I think you do have to have a burning ambition. Uh, you've got to be incredibly motivated to put one of these together. But I, I'm looking at this audience as it filed in. I'm really impressed. Thanks for so many coming. There are at least 20 people in this room who could be leaders of program project grants at UTMB. UTMB is one of the greatest places in the world to do this. We work across departments. We work across divisions. These uh, program project grants, these uh, U grants, these P50s, these P01s need to do that. They need to work uh, with multi, multi disciplines. Uh, the leader, it can't be about the leader. It's got to be about the team and the product and the, uh, the uh, mission. I'm a burn doctor. I build a burn center. I have incredible ambition and, and, and uh, drive to make a burn center work. I have participants from almost every division in this university, 60 uh, individuals, but uh, you have to have a core of individuals that are the leadership of that grant to lead each project and to be the overall leader. That person has to be enthusiastic, confident, charismatic, and can't really be a jerk. It can't all be about you. It's got to be about the people that you're trying trying to bring together. Fortunately, Dr. Brazier is going to talk about teamwork and how to try to develop teamwork and how to build teamwork. You have to have a vision that Dr. Goodwin was talking about, an overwhelming, steaming vision and a sentence and a hook that's going to carry forward your project. You need to be able to effectively communicate that vision to everybody, um, not just to your group, but you got to start there. You need to get others excited to uh, follow you and to go the extra mile to get things done. You need to be able to coach and not hector. Um, you really can't be a surgeon to do this, Dr. Helmick. You gotta <laughs> get, get people to want to do it. Um, you need to be able to balance conflicts, be able to handle crises, 
And don't belittle anybody that works for you or they're not going to work for you again. And I'm going to finish with that too and maybe Dr. Brazier will help me out a little bit with that. Each and every uh, one of you here probably can be a leader of this kind of grant, but you got to change your mindset a little bit. Dr. Goodwin told you that he, uh, he dropped his projects on every one of his uh, big grants. Uh, I, I am uh, a clinician, so I run a clinical core, uh, but don't run any particular uh, project in our overall grant. But to administer one of these grants, you've got to you got to take a couple years to write these. You've got to spend four or five years to uh, keep them going, and it better be a part of your life plan, that that's going to be a part of your career plan and something you're going to keep as part of your career uh, for decades. Uh, this effort is something that uh, will reward you incredibly. You need to make a plan and a timeline that Dr. Cunningham's going to go over in great detail. You need to delegate. There has to be regular communication. Now, many of us say uh, once a month. You really need to do this more often than that. You, once a week uh, when you're starting up is, is a minimum for regular team meetings. You have to set goals. Uh, you have to review success and failure, and you've got to reward and motivate as you're going along. Now, the leader needs to administer, but not as and for himself. It's as and for the group. You really need to, you need every one of the program uh, sub-investigators to be leaders and able to fill in or succeed you. You should have a strong number two, especially if you're around the world like Dr. Brazier or Goodwin are occasionally. You need to have somebody that can meet once a week, that can deal with all of the other uh, PIs on a daily basis. You need to recruit strong leaders for each area. And I'm going to go into a little bit about what uh, I think you have to have to be a leader of an overall grant and what you need is strong leaders in each area in order to get a grant funded. But it's not rocket science. It's things that all of you uh, know. Uh, the budgets and the personnel I'll talk about uh, uh, later as we get through here. Now, uh, basically we're talking about PO1s and P50s, so there are many other uh, P-type mechanisms. Uh, the PO1s, projects uh, contribute or directly relate to a common theme in biomedical science and a system of research activities and projects is directed towards a well-defined program goal, a theme uh, that, that you can talk about, one cell, one tissue. Uh, P50s generally uh, are uh, dealing with um, a spectrum of activities that are multidisciplinary that specifically attack a disease entity like aging or uh, uh, burns or um, allergy or immune deficiency that have a, an overwhelming, uh, uh, that have an overarching uh, as well as a sub theme. Centers may serve also as regional or national resources for special research and they may interact with other um, centers. Uh, you need to target a little bit your uh, activities to uh, the calls, uh, to what uh, the RFAs are, to what's available. Um, as well as to your passion. Now to be a, a leader of one of these, you need to be well suited to the call, to the RFA. You have to have appropriate experience and training as uh, um, judged by outside peer review groups. You, there's no point doing this unless you've had a few R01s or you've got uh, some national standing uh, uh, and some uh, clout. Uh, it's, it's not worth going to this level of career development until you've done that. You have to demonstrate an ongoing record of accomplishment. I won't get into numbers, but an impact level or something that's going to take national acclaim. Collaborative, complementary, and uh, expertise leadership approach that uh, is kind and gentle. The level of effort for the PI some people say you have to throw your whole life into this, but if, if you write on the grant that you're going to spend less than 10% uh, on the grant, it's going to be turned down, and you really need to spend about 30% of your activities uh, behind this. It needs to be a large portion of your passion. For the administration alone, you must spend 10% of your time. If you're going to have a scientific 
uh, grant, you have to spend 20% on that grant, and you need about 30% of your activities uh, before you go on to this. Uh, you need to ensure scientific goals are met, you need to develop structure, you need to focus, um, you need to ensure that progress is steady and strong from five or six thoroughbreds. Now your sub-directors, uh, you need about five projects on one of these, maybe seven. Uh, you might start with seven and end up with five. Uh, uh, that may be your choice, as it was with Dr. Goodwin's, because it wasn't a good fit, or it may be the st study section's choice. Uh, um, in their grading. Uh, they sometimes sacrifice uh, two, but it's really hard to get a project to go unless you've got uh, five different uh, investigators who are all well-funded uh, R01 uh, national leaders coming from different perspectives looking at the common theme who can mesh together and who will work together, who will communicate once a week, who will... Uh, the, the key to all of these is that the sum is greater than the individual components. That, uh, and that's what the leader's job is, is to make the sum different than the individual components. You're taking people who have spent their lives being extremely successful in getting R01s and dealing with their individual component to change their mindset a little bit, to interact with each other, to make a product which is greater than they could have done on their own. And also to make the institution better, to make training better, uh, to make young people better, uh, and to ensure a synergistic uh, progress that is steady and strong. You got to commit 10% of your effort to administration, and for a surgeon that's saying a lot. Um, you really need about 30% time on these, and you need to have another person who's going to be a leader uh, to lead for you whenever you're out of town, or whenever you're in the operating room, or whenever you're anywhere else, uh, who you can trust uh, and trust you. Um, you need to create advisory boards internally, advisory boards that are national. The grants have to include uh, really strong people. Um, they have to use shared resources. Those shared resources have to make the individual products greater than the individual projects. Uh, program annual meetings uh, um, are not enough. Weekly meetings have to be uh, performed. Now there are other little details like uh, websites that are interactive and uh, interaction with other programs and uh, interactions with other centers that can really augment how this is done. But my little ditty here is uh, to introduce some concepts and hopefully Dr. Brazier, Dr. Cunningham, and Dr. Goodwin will uh, chime in just about leadership. Uh, what? What is that leader supposed to do? I has to have enough of a track record if it's going to be a translational grant in clinical care as well as having written enough uh, articles. Has to have enough professional experience and national stature uh, to be funded. I think the person has to be a really good teacher, have fellowship training experience, ability to mentor junior investigators, uh, uh, to show uh, this to an outside review group as well as to inspire primarily the internal group that this is a good teacher, a good collaborator, and somebody who can bring a group along. Uh, the details of identifying the project's cores and administrative structure, uh, you start about a year and a half before you submit a grant. Uh, you describe collaboration and synergy among groups First, you got to develop a group that has collaboration and synergy and has demonstrated collaboration and synergy, and you've got to have preliminary data that shows that you've got the ability to collaborate and uh, work together. Sometimes that means five years or ten years of working together and producing products that are uh, interactive before people will really uh, buy it. You have to have directors of each one of the programs that have worked together and the uh, sum of their productivities have been better than they would have been on their own. Identifying goals and milestones that are a passion to each of the individual investigators is key. Grant preparation, uh, the details and the timeline is really Dr. Cunningham's area. Uh, there are uh, um, details about sharing and teamwork, uh, like who's going to be on the publications, how are you going to share uh, uh, who's going to get what out of what? Uh, 
that begin at the heart of this. It's a uh, heart of the uh, the leadership uh, concept and heart of trying to get one of these uh, started. Uh, a great way to let a group fall apart is if uh, um, it's not clear from the beginning who's going to do what throughout the rest of the program and who's going to get credit for it. There has to be a procedure for resolving conflicts and it's basically up to the leader uh, to resolve conflicts without belittling and without public humiliation and without public uh, blow-ups in some sort of private way. Effective uh, leadership is uh, uh, one leader can't always manage the interpersonal needs of all. Uh, groups uh, formally or informally give their alliance to other subleaders, and there need to be several subleaders in such an effort. <coughs> the most effective leader is one who engages the talents of the others and empowers them to use their abilities. Uh, failure to empower really limits this a lot. And um, I'm, I'm not sure that my words are conveying this appropriately. I think the reason I was selected for this is because I am a surgical personality. Somehow you got to put that away. And uh, you've got to make the people that are working for you uh, the empowered individuals. And you have to stand back and coordinate. You have to get your gratifications through their performance, not your performance. It's not all about the leader or it'll never work, just won't go anywhere. Identify your own strengths and weaknesses before you get into this. Um, recruit the other leaders to the other projects who can complement your skills. Know when to be able to step back and give them uh, the reins and the credit that is their due. You gotta identify yourself, your institution, your group as a center of excellence, nationally and internationally. You need to identify a specialty where you can make that happen. You need to identify activities and productivity that will show the world that you're able to do that. You need to provide teaching and education uh, and have a track record for it. You need to set goals, develop metrics, and make sure that things are communicated to the world. you got to publish a lot. And Dr. Brazier, I think, will tell you that groups working between divisions and uh, working from many different angles are more productive than individuals working themselves. We can do this. Share. For God's sake, share. To have a successful, efficient team, you got to share leadership. And you've got to make sure that everybody is respected. Successful formal leaders will encourage leadership roles of the other members of the team, not themselves. And that's really uh, hard to take for a surgeon. And it may be hard to take for each one of you, but uh, sharing leadership and power is difficult. Uh, after all, uh, the principal investigator does have the ultimate responsibility and liability, and, um, but you're going to have to live with that and let other people uh, um, be able to uh, take the credit you need to validate the importance of their expertise, their decision-making abilities. Um, you remain responsible, but you're not going to be successful unless you make uh, the individuals perform. Um, ownership has to be from every member that you recruit to it. Meet with them at least every week, not every month if you can. The leader has to give multiple opportunities for the uh, team members to voice their opinions and offer their expertise, and you can't shut them out, and you can't denigrate them. You need to encourage and praise. Uh, you can't openly criticize. You can't demean people in public. These are pretty simple concepts, but if you don't want to do this, don't get in the business. Dr. Brazier, do you have some comments about leadership? Your, um, the spirit of, of making sure that every team member feels connected, and I think that's really an important uh, activity, and it's not always that simple to do. The other thing I, I want to reemphasize, and I'll talk about that as well, is that uh, building teams takes a lot of commitment and time, 
and uh, it's not something that you can just put together for an RFA that comes up in, in two months and, and be able to build a credible group. It, it's really something that really takes a significant amount of, of planning and regular meetings and developing shared vision and, and lots of other activities that go with that. Dr. Cunningham, any comments about this subject? I, you know, everything that you were outlining is, is so important, but the comment that you kept making about the leader needs to bring out the best in the team, and being able to work with a group, you have to be, work with people that work with you, right? You can't make somebody work in a team, and I think you addressed that in your presentation. So it has to address the needs of the group, and not just the leaders. So it, it morphs over time. It changes. Dr. Powell, you've been doing this for lots of years. You got a comment? Well, I think y'all hit it on the head. Uh, you know, there are many kinds and styles of leadership, but the one that works the best here is so-called servant leader that uh, you know, recognizes that the team and the whole thing that you're trying to do would be a lot better if you let other people a lot of the credit. Boss? Questions from, uh, questions or comments? I, you know, I, I, the only thing I would say is, and you said it, it's very, very hard. Just like writing. Dr. Herndon, I think, is probably the best writer. If you ever want a model for writing clearly, uh, check out his R01s. But it isn't easy. Uh, uh, all of us are good writers. That's how we got to be PS. But it isn't easy, and it isn't easy being a leader either, because all those things you want to do, you constantly have to suppress. So I, I totally agree with that message. Is there questions from the audience? The audience. Next up. Okay. Okay, I'm all ready to go. Uh, well, anyway, I, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about forming a team. So my view of the leadership is that you don't want to step in the leadership, as Dilbert says. But really, it's the team and, and the, the design and working of the team that makes uh, things really uh, work smoothly with regards to a multiple uh, PI component uh, project. And um, I, I want to uh, say a couple words about teams because I think that there's been a lot of, of growth in terms of our sophistication about how teams work and what actually constitutes uh, a, a well-functioning team. And so some of this uh, I think might be a little bit repetitive uh, to you, uh, to those of you who may have attended our uh, Innovate to Translate conference that we had in the ITS. Uh, but as you know, there's been a, a whole development of a discipline on the science of team science that's evolved really over the last five to eight years or so. Uh, studying this, this phenomenon, uh, which is the uh, rise of multidisciplinarity in uh, terms of uh, uh, bio biomedical uh, research investigation. And this has been a trend that's uh, really been going on for the last uh, 25 years or so. And uh, a lot of uh, people have studied this phenomenon and really the major drivers for why uh, teams are being formed now and being used to address uh, problems are two. One is that uh, we have an increasing specialization in science. So more and more uh, technology is, is driving uh, very narrow uh, development of subspecialty expertise. But at the same time, uh, the funding agencies like the NIH and NSF and others are challenging us uh, as scientists to to address very complex uh, social and biological problems. So it becomes quite obvious that uh, people with very narrow fields of expertise need to work together in order to be able to address these really uh, important uh, problems. So there are a, a number of uh, um, people that are investigating uh, how teams form, uh, what are the successes of teams, and how better to promote teams. And so there's now uh, developing a lot of of uh, knowledge about best practices of, of teams. And so I want to talk a little bit about why we uh, are interested in teams and uh, then uh, discuss some, some strategies that, that we've used that uh, are uh, applications of teams within the academic uh, enterprise and some of the ideas that I have about this in my years of both forming teams and, and studying teams. 
So there's a, a lot of work that shows that using bibliometric uh, uh, indices, that teams really are the fastest growing type of authorship structure and that they contribute uh, the more high impact studies. So team-based publications are more frequently cited and uh, team-based patents are more likely to be licensed and used. And this is, I think, uh, we have to use this as a qualifier and that is that effective teams result in higher uh, impact studies. Not all teams are necessarily effective and, and I think that we need to pay attention to the process around teams and I know Jim hates it when I stop talking about evaluations and processes. But processes actually are important and processes are important in teams and they really help to form the fabric by which teams are, are useful. So we know that teams are growing in terms of their, uh, uh, their applications. And there's only one field, which is the arts and humanities, in which, there's, uh, uh, the, the, which in, in which there is not this development or evolution towards multi-investigator uh, publications. So t um, there are several reasons for why the teams are important. One is that uh, team science leads to greater innovation. So there's a very interesting um, uh, paper by Nora Dysis in Science Translational Medicine, which relates uh, team science to the uh, evolutionary theory of creativity. And that has to do with how teams are, are able to go through processes of variation, selection, and then retention in ways that are not possible by more siloed investigators. So, uh, for example, if, uh, if a group is given a problem, uh, the, the process of creating multiple solutions to that problem, uh, uh, a team is, is, ca is capable of creating a more diverse set of initial solutions. They're then able to more rapidly select those solutions that are likely to work and then ultimately retain and then disseminate uh, those uh, effective solutions into the scientific community. So there's a, a lot of uh, theory behind uh, how teams are more uh, able to embrace and uh, develop innovation than what an individual investigator uh, can do. The other more important criteria that everybody asks me whenever I talk about teams is, well, do teams do anything, are they more productive? And uh, I, I think that there's uh, quite a bit of experience that shows that effective teams are more productive than uh, similarly uh, uh, grouped individuals. This is a series of, um, of, of outcome studies that were in the um, tobacco uh, research youth centers that was funded by the uh, NSF uh, that Kara Hall, who was one of our uh, keynote speakers at the uh, Innovate to Translate conference, uh, talked about. And uh, so these uh, tobacco research centers were intended to be uh, multidisciplinary. So they, they were charged with developing interventions that reduced uh, tobacco use. So they were, were uh, intended to be uh, multidisciplinary teams involving behavioral uh, psychologists, uh, and very basic molecular biologists, and uh, were challenged to work together on this very complex social problem. So uh, Kara had, had studied uh, the, the process, of the productivity of these teams, both in terms of the number of publications per year and the cumulative uh, publications, and she came with the following findings, uh, which is that uh, the, the uh, tobacco research centers started off being less productive than uh, similarly matched uh, long-standing R01s, which had similar number of investigators in them, or uh, stacked R01s, which would be sequential R01s uh, that were uh, run by individual siloed investigators from the onset of the funding. So the first three years of these tobacco research centers, most of the tobacco research centers were less productive than uh, an equivalently matched cohort. But after that, they then uh, significantly outperformed all the other uh, types of funding uh, vehicles. And this, is probably, and this is important because it really says that uh, yeah, uh, effective teams uh, uh, are capable of outproducing other types of uh, uh, team uh, uh, science-based uh, approaches, but it's not immediate, and it takes a while for that group uh, to develop a sense of vision and a sense of cohesion in order to be able to effectively work together in order to actually start uh, producing these. So I think that this is, uh, this is reality. This is what uh, my practical experience has been as well is that it really takes a, a bit of time to uh, develop a, a uh, competitive and successful group and probably is why it's, it takes five years or more, in my opinion, to, to get to the point from original concept to a funded multidisciplinary grant or a program project.
So I sort of think about uh, team design strategy in three uh, general ways. And one of the, the underlying idea here is that you really need to tailor the development of the team to its purpose. So I, I work with uh, three different types of, of teams, one of which I would call interprofessional or transdisciplinary teams. So this is the, the, the traditional, we're going to solve a very important problem. Uh, we're going to develop new disciplines and we're going to focus on research publications and funding. And the teams that are grown out of that are very different than some of the uh, multidisciplinary translational teams, which is the construct that we've been pushing within the CTSA, which is more of a hybrid academic and uh, a product or work team, which is uh, using interdisciplinary research to develop a industry-like product, a drug or a device or an intervention. And the nature of that sort of interaction is very different than the uh, transdisciplinary teams and I think it requires some different processes and uh, 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 strategies for supporting that. The other uh, type of team is a academic work team which I uh, have used uh, to uh, respond to NIH contracts. So uh, the first interdisciplinary team for example would be an approach that we would use to getting a P01 or a center grant these multidisciplinary translational teams would be for developing clinical studies and, and, and uh, commercializing products. But the academic work teams would be more like what uh, an NIH contract response would be. So uh, NIH offers these contract mechanisms which are basically statements of work and they want you to do a particular task. So one example uh, of a contract that we have uh, recently completed would be the uh, NIAID Clinical Proteomics Center. And in that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well, but the statement of work was basically we would serve as a resource center for doing proteomic studies. And so the, the work team uh, development here was around structuring uh, our core resource laboratories in a way that was effective to move our uh, 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 units of work uh, in order to meet our contract demands. So those are, those are different uh, types of structures and they require different uh, ways, uh, strategies for building as well as uh, different uh, compositions. So uh, David uh, talked a little bit about uh, this uh, process of developing a, a program project and I just wanted to highlight you know, in my personal anecdotal experience in terms of developing a program project in the NHLBI Proteomics Center which was uh, probably over uh, 12 years or so uh, in, in terms of development. So we first started off as uh, a, a two investigator collaboration with uh, Roberto Garofalo and myself just working on this problem of mucosal viral infections. And we used and we clued together uh, a, a variety of funding mechanisms which allowed us to eventually grow the, the team and to develop a track record in which we A, established the credibility that we were capable of doing this type of study and, that, and B, we had a unique niche in uh, terms of uh, being able to leverage this into a program project. So we got the, the uh, ARP funding which I think is now defunct but this was just a two year grant to, to try to uh, uh, train, uh, develop projects around uh, training uh, of uh, students here in Texas. Uh, this positioned us well in an in a earlier time for develop, getting an R01. I, I don't think you could do that after, after in these days now after just a single pilot, but maybe if you're good you can. We were then also able to attract some NIEHS internal funding which uh, was oriented around a pilot project. Then we extended uh, the membership of our team to include uh, several other investigators in the uh, uh, airway, uh, the APEX division uh, to uh, get an asthma and allergic uh, disease center uh, which uh, supported us quite well for about five years. With the, with the uh, departure of one of the uh, principals, uh, we were then uh, able to approach uh, NIEID and turn the AADRC into a program project. And as uh, Jim had mentioned, the, the nature of these program projects have changed uh, su significantly. So we uh, initially just got uh, uh, approval from NIEID to get an investigator uh, funded program project which we were successful in competing for. But on our recompetition, re the uh, NIAID really clamped down on what uh, it would uh, entertain as program projects. So we ended up having to travel to NIH twice for site visits in which we pitched our ideas for a program project. And in uh, getting responses uh, from the uh, 
the division directors at NIAID refined our program project, went back in. Uh, we got um, scored but not funded on one cycle. We had to then repeat that uh, for our second uh, time. We subsequently were able to get it refunded and now we have an active program project. This body of work then uh, allowed us to uh, uh, serve that as a core for an NHLBI uh, technology center, which is more related to one of those work groups that I talked about. So I think this is just to say that you really need to have a significant commitment and, and uh, perseverance in order to be able to, to grow a team that, that would actually be uh, to the point where you could get uh, program projects. You can skirt some of this if you already have investigators say, you know, we built this basically from scratch in which we were really not funded at the time that we started this. Uh, you can skirt some of this by assembling already R01 funded investigators, but you're not going to skirt it by much because you're still going to have to demonstrate a track record of collaboration and a track record of uh, interaction in order for the study section to really believe that you're capable of being able to do uh, the work that you propose. So <coughs> there's a lot, again, um, uh, and Jim's going to hate this word, but uh, there's a lot of evaluation that goes on in terms of learning about how teams work. And so uh, there's uh, uh, people who, who study teams and, and look at teams, and this is also shared in some of our experience, but what is it that makes a, a team effective? And uh, David hinted about the leadership role in this. But one of the most important things is that you really have to have an environment in which there's a significant amount of trust among the collaborators. And trust really means uh, a sense of psychological safety. So that if you have um, a, a crazy idea, and you're, but you're scared to, to say it uh, because somebody's going to make fun of you in the group or you, they're going to think it's a crazy idea, you haven't gotten to the level of the team where you're really going to be uh, transformative. So this, this level of trust uh, has to transcend both I'm, I'm going to uh, share data with my buddies and I know they're not going to scoop me. They're going to, any uh, publications, we're going to be uh, jointly uh, acknowledged. Uh, grants in which we both uh, are capable of participating in will be included when that's appropriate. But also, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm safe in that environment. I can throw out ideas and they're not going to laugh at me. So the other uh, things has to do with uh, promoting teamwork and communication. And as you get into more and more interdisciplinary work, at, at UTMB, I think we really, much of the, um, the, the disciplines, we, we really have a pretty narrow set of disciplines here on this university. We don't have very, very many mathematicians. We don't have very many behavioral scientists, although we have a few. <coughs> we don't have uh, uh, many uh, um, uh, people in, in pharmacy schools and other things. So uh, we have a pretty narrow set of views and a very narrow set of uh, communication skills in which we need to be able to uh, communicate pretty effectively with everyone else here. But if you really are uh, building a team which has a lot of different disciplines in them, you need to spend quite a bit of time in terms of learning uh, the other uh, individual's world's view. Uh, they may look at problems very differently than you and learning how to uh, talk to them, learning how they think about key concepts is, is incredi incredibly important for how that uh, uh, teamwork actually works. And we talked a little bit at the Innovate to Translate uh, conference with this idea of interprofessional uh, disciplines. And there are several different uh, activities that you can do that I'll point you to uh, some uh, websites that, that uh, you can uh, use if you're really trying to get truly interdisciplinary uh, work within your team. Uh, other things here I think uh, David talked a little bit about, uh, facilitating teams, uh, managing conflict, and then developing this uh, collective interdisciplinary knowledge, which is the, the uh, key for a, a transformative team where you're actually uh, uh, spanning different disciplines. One of the things that I think is extraordinarily useful, is, and I would point this to you, this is also available on our ITS website, is the uh, field guide to collaboration in team science. This was uh, written by uh, 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 Dr. Bennett and uh, Levin Finley, who were uh, NIH ombudsmen who uh, spent virtually all of their professional career mediating uh, conflicts at NIH around teams and team science. And so they learned a lot of very practical things that are useful in terms of promoting collaboration in team science. Things like building a research team, fostering trust, talking about handling conflict, uh, strengthening team dynamics, 
Uh, it's, a, it's a very good read. I really encourage you to take a look at that uh, if you're really serious about uh, promoting teams. And this is based on best practices, or at least their anecdotal experience of best practices as well. We all also know that uh, effective teams have some component of conflict. So there are uh, honest uh, conflicts that, that come up, but there also are uh, uh, issues around um, um, intellectual property protection, authorship, and that sort of thing, which routinely arise during the concept, uh, during the conduct of a, of a team. And <coughs> uh, Dr. Bennett actually uh, recommends that if you're uh, going to be developing a, a team that's going to work over a long period of time, that you might think about actually a prenuptial agreement, uh, which is uh, basically a, a, a memorandum of understanding for participation in this group that uh, how we communicate, how we assign authorship, how we assign intellectual property and, and patent applications is agreed before uh, people uh, start to join in the group. And uh, they seem to think that this is a, a very effective way of, of managing or, or upfront uh, addressing some problems uh, which may arise later if you, if you let them slide. And I can tell you that uh, if you're working on a very interesting project and everybody is working along and everybody thinks that they did the most important experiment in that project, and then you start to talk about, well, who's going to be first author and who's going to be senior author, that that's, that's a, a real recipe for uh, developing conflict. So having a discussion up front uh, prior to uh, uh, really engaging in significant science can help uh, save a lot of headache down the road. Uh, uh, Kara Hall had talked a little bit about the resources that are available at the Team Science uh, Toolkit. So this is an, a website at uh, NCI. Uh, it's on your handouts. Uh, you, you might want to uh, view it. There are a lot of uh, things uh, in this toolkit, uh, some skills, uh, some practical uh, reading. Uh, and if you uh, are, are interested in pursuing this, I highly encourage you uh, to participate in that. Another question that frequently comes up is how do I form a team or how do I connect with other individuals? And I'm just going to give a quick plug uh, to SciVal. Uh, so uh, this is a, uh, a research a networking tool that uh, the UT system has uh, purchased for uh, all of UT sites, uh, which is available on our uh, research resources uh, page. I don't know. If, uh, <clears throat> so if you go to the uh, UTME homepage, click on resources or research, then on the right-hand side of the research resources is SciVal. And you can, uh, so SciVal is connected to all, uh, some hundred or so universities uh, and pulls up information about uh, collaborators. So you can search uh, on basically keywords. Uh, so if you're interested in finding some collaborators that might be interested in inflammation or something like that, you can um, search the, uh, SciVal site, uh, you can limit it to, to UTMB or you can limit it to any of the other sites. You can pull up investigators and you can learn about what they do. And so you can uh, click on investigators here. They'll tell you a little bit about some of their fingerprints, some of their, uh, uh, their research networking, and, uh, you, uh, and, their, and their grant funding. And so you can uh, try to uh, scope out you know, individuals that, that may have authority and, and may have uh, real uh, skill sets that you might want to participate in. So the SciVal is, is a research networking tool that's, that's available for your use and I encourage you to take, it, take advantage of it. Um, <clears throat> as Dave had indicated, uh, both uh, in the uh, application, not only do you want to necessarily highlight uh, the leadership of uh, the uh, project, but also uh, that your team is actively functioning and that you have a track record of interactions. And I have uh, taken out uh, a couple of uh, sections from uh, one of the funded grants that, that uh, Roberto and I have on um, where we ha have tried to highlight uh, our team interactions through the application. So there's an overall section in, in program projects where you describe uh, for example, the environment in which your work is being done, what the projects are, how they interact. But also, I include uh, several sections about our collaboration record. So I put in a, a very specific section about the collaboration uh, record of the individuals uh, and talk about that we've had uh, publications, we've had extramural grant funding, I cite the, the publications, I describe the grants and, and the ones that are active. And uh, this really helps to uh, convey that there's a very active and robust interaction 
of these uh, uh, project leaders. Uh, in, in the review of most program projects, uh, the, there's a two-component review. So one is that uh, the, the grant, uh, at least nowadays, program projects wouldn't have more than uh, three or four uh, individual projects. Uh, they get all broken up, and so individual investigators will review each, each individual project, and they all talk about it, and they score them, and, and, and so on. But then there's a second phase of the program project, which the review then goes to how, what is the synergy between these projects? And Dave alluded to this a little bit in, in his, um, his talk, but uh, if you have uh, three or four projects that are largely distinct and that they, they don't synergize the experiments from one project don't inform the other, uh, then, then you get uh, the overall program score suffers significantly. By contrast, if you have uh, projects that, that are very tightly interacted, that there's multiple threads of, of collaboration between them and you communicate that well, then your score can frequently go up. And in the first, uh, our first Asthma and Allergic Disease Research Center, we all got Metsa Metsa scores for each one of our projects. But we had such a good track record of uh, joint publications and collaborations that our score went in half uh, during the second phase of that review. So we got funded because of our uh, interactions and our collaboration record. So if you have strengths in this area, you ought to make sure that you highlight them. So this collaboration record uh, in the overall section is appropriate. We also highlight this in the biosketch. So in the biosketch, for example, we'll talk about uh, papers in which we've jointly published. So I, I'll say, you know, these are peer-reviewed uh, publications in the biosketch. And then I, I highlight my name, but I also underline my co-investigators that, that are in this application to give the, uh, the reviewers that just sort of glance through this the impression that, yeah, we actually work and we collaborate effectively together. So this, these are two little uh, tips that, that I found that have been useful in terms of helping to improve your score. <clears throat> uh, David also talked a little bit about the multiple PD, uh, PI leadership plan. These are relatively new. Um, in uh, Program projects in the past have really been mostly individual uh, PIs. But now uh, NIH is including and actually in some cases mandating that you have a multiple PIPD leadership plan. And again, I go back to uh, in the leadership plan, I talk about our record of interaction. So if, if they didn't read the overview, and, but they're reading the leadership plan, they're going to see it. So I talk about a record of interactions. I talk about our individual responsibilities, what, what each one of the PIs are going to do. I talk about <clears throat> our uh, types of our meetings and our interactions. I describe a, a mechanism for conflict resolution. I describe how uh, leadership transition or change in location would happen or how the program would, would continue in, in such a case. And then how we share publications and intellectual property. So a lot of these things are still the, uh, the very fabric of what uh, effective teams are, but we put them into the leadership plan uh, to help to communicate that. Uh, the other type of team is the multidisciplinary translational teams. Uh, so these are uh, a hybrid a academic uh, industry model where we work on both uh, generating new knowledge and training uh, investigators, but also work on a product-like device. And so the CTSA has been working and studying how best to, to pr promote these uh, translational teams. They're, again, a different kettle of fish with a different purpose than these uh, transdisciplinary uh, project teams that I described earlier. And uh, an example for this, uh, for example, would be uh, a severe asthma uh, research team that Bill Calhoun runs. And so we have a number of different representatives here. These, the people that participate in this are, are selected because they help to uh, promote the uh, translational uh, goal. And so there, there are a number of skill sets here that, that helped uh, work on this translational project. And this group uh, collaborates extensively with an external network. And uh, the things that we've learned in terms of observing the translational teams is that the, the teams that are effective, the, the teams that are publishing and the teams that are getting grants, have very good leaders, they meet regularly, they have a shared common uh, vision and goal, and uh, then everything else from that follows. And so uh, th those are the things that we're still learning a little bit uh, about the translational teams. Uh, so we have put on the ITS website some resources for translational teams, uh, both literature as well as uh, some of uh, the papers that we published uh, regards uh, how uh, teams work and uh, how uh, 
Uh, the teams have transformed the environment here at UTMB. And, and again, I'll, I'll echo what David mentioned is that, that, that UTMB is, is a very unique environment with regards to being able to promote uh, interdisciplinary collaborations. And I trace this back to the original uh, view of the, the Sealy Centers, which I think really helped to break down a lot of the departmental silos back in the early 90s that uh, UTMB is quite now well-versed in terms of interdisciplinary and interdepartmental collaborations. And so this is a very good environment. We should really be quite proud of, of this very collegial and collaborative environment, which has uh, really taken probably over 20 years to develop. But in any case, there are a number of resources here. Please visit our ITS website. We also have some uh, certificate programs in team science management and team leadership uh, for those of you who are, are interested in translational teams. Um, the, the NCI Toolbox also has uh, some skills and uh, resources for promoting, uh, improving cross-disciplinary communications. Again, this is at the NCI uh, uh, Toolbox, uh, and uh, it, these are uh, ways of helping to promote uh, interdisciplinary dialogue and applications. Finally, uh, this uh, concept of work teams, uh, these are, uh, again, designed to uh, support uh, NIH uh, type contract statements of work. Uh, so we had a, a five-year uh, clinical proteomics center that was charged with uh, uh, collaborating with outside investigators to do a series of, of uh, proteomics studies around uh, ultimately identifying biomarkers that are associated with infectious disease. So we, we assembled uh, seven teams that uh, each of whom had a distinct responsibility and was linked to uh, a number of our uh, uh, University core laboratories. Uh, one of them was in the biomolecular resource uh, facility. We also used the Office of Biostatistics for the uh, bioinformatics component. The uh, Next Generation Sequencing Molecular Technologies contributed as well, and then uh, the uh, uh, Sealy Center for Molecular Medicine uh, Quantitative Proteomics Group also participated. Each one of these teams had a very well defined expertise that was aligned with what. The, the major statements of work were. And uh, so we then provided uh, a way of ad administering and supporting these groups, making sure that they work together. And uh, ultimately that allowed us to be uh, um, competitive and awarded uh, for this, uh, this contract. Uh, so uh, if I haven't said it before, and if you haven't gotten it yet, team building takes a lot of effort and it takes time. And we think that uh, team leadership is really one of the most important determinants of success. There are best practices and there are resources for supporting team uh, formation. Uh, use these. If, and and uh, you don't necessarily have to recreate the, <laughs> reinvent the wheel. These, these are out there. They're, they work pretty well. Uh, your prenup agreements and uh, 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 skill sets for promoting interdisciplinary uh, communication are, are well, uh, well worth uh, considering. You should be uh, quite selective in terms of adding additional team members uh, and make sure that they complement the activity of the team and that these team members are uh, capable of working in a collaborative environment. So there's, a, there's this idea of um, collaboration readiness, uh, which you can actually assess in terms of how well people are able to share data and how well people are, are capable of in, in, uh, engaging other um, uh, world views. Uh, to select when somebody might be in addition to a team. By contrast, if you, if you select uh, people that don't work well in a team, you can really uh, uh, undo a lot of uh, work that you've used uh, to develop a, an effective team. So uh, be very careful about how you select additional team members for an existing team uh, before, you, before you add them. And then uh, I think you have to really be uh, in any grant application, you want to make sure that you spend a lot of time presenting the team, their roles, their track record of interactions, and how they will allow for uh, success of the grant. So those are my comments on teams, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks. I got the more practical end. We've heard a great deal about leadership and the, the, the general aspects that are needed for conducting this kind of uh, planning and conducting research in a team. And I want to address two practical aspects. The first is the timeline, and we heard a bit about the timeline. And Alan, that was a great example of a timeline, and it started in 1993, 1993, I believe. And, uh, and you can see what it has spawned off over the years. And so 
um, I thought uh, a lot about this and uh, from the perspective of what's the most uh, concrete period of time you might be able to do this relative to the time it takes. And I, and I actually do think that if the team were correctly organized around some of the principles that we've just heard about, that a timeline between two and five years might be possible to put together, put together a critical mass of investigators that could work together to, uh, to develop a shared interest across multiple departments, schools, and institutes. Now, as you saw from Alan's example, and I could give you a similar example from, example from my experience, it actually, it actually took us more like 10 years to get the first, our, our P50. We started with a, started with a P20, P50, a P30, um, and now we've just spawned off a U54. But the, the message is that these, once you capture this credible leader of investigators and develop the resources and the capabilities to put these together, then you have a chance at spawning off an even larger um, uh, approach to the, to the problem. So for instance, from the clinical perspective, we started with a, a very basic research group, and now we have clinical investigators and we're conducting clinical research. So the credible team of leaders, uh, we've talked a bit about that. You need to have those, uh, that credibility, to, and they have to be willing to keep momentum and keep the, keep the program, build the community, and identify the resources and collaborators that might be missing. Um, meeting, nobody likes to hear that word. Actually, it's kind of a dirty word in a lot of our minds, but uh, meeting at least monthly during this initial timeline you, you can't get around it. You have got to create the language. You've got to create the language across disciplines. Having the experience of working with <laughs> a chemist, a cell biologist, a behaviorist, preclinical pharmacologist like myself, and a clinical investigator in the same room, when we started, we had no idea what we were doing. I couldn't understand the chemistry. He couldn't <coughs> understand the models that we were using um, uh, preclinically. <coughs> and so this, the meetings were absolutely critical to start off the process of creating the, the new language, sharing the data, and planning what happens next. This takes a great deal of commitment and trust. And even in the face of not being able to know the language, I think that was my best example of how, did, how are we to pull that together? How are we even supposed to scan for funding opportunities? That was that we start that process right up, right up front. What are there actually opportunities? Um, and so we started with, I didn't mention that, but internal, we had internal and external uh, small grants, seed grants, and really critical, the second part of what I'm gonna talk about is the inter interface with NIH and how important that is to generating these, these kinds of programs. So that's two to five years, maybe 10 years of committed effort. Uh, and then we move into the, the phase of, well, we finally got our act together. We're starting to think about all the pieces of the parts we can pull together. And we've identified an opportunity. And once that opportunity is identified, then we really start pounding on it. We're meeting weekly. We're discussing aims. We're throwing back and forth all of the preliminary data that are needing. We're st we've started plotting the cores and the projects, and they're going to morph, and something's going to fall out, and something else might be added. It'll change. And then we also address gaps that we're identifying, because as you go along, you realize that although you may have a strong team, those gaps are going to be um, evident. And at this point, we've added the grants and business coordinators um, into the mix so that we can keep the ball going with developing the science at the same time we're developing the budgets and the same time we're developing all the, <coughs> the administrative aspects of pulling one of these off. A really important part, and, and some of this may seem like we should, you know, we, we apply this in all of our grant getting opportunities, but in this case, dealing with project officers, branch chiefs, and division directors when you're planning a large proposal of this sort is absolutely critical. The last thing you want to do is put together a 400-page center grant and find out that they don't want it. <laughs> and it's happened. It has happened. And it's just, it's heart-wrenching when you find, when somebody finds that out. It's not happened to me, but I do know people that it's happened to. Uh, so uh, well, I'm going to return to this concept of working with, uh, with NIH in this case, although it applies as equally as well with foundations. If foundations are funding multi-investigator multi <coughs> projects, you want to be part of, uh, part of inter an inter you want a very important interface with that group. Three to 12 months means three months to 12 months before it's due. 
Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, and I think the three months is really ambitious. Uh, because when we get to the one to six month category here, now you're really, you're really invested. This is a every day, all day, as much time as you can put on it activity. And the timeline stretches, uh, in, in our case, we use the last six months usually. And this is where we bring science and business together. And this is where people like um, uh, our secret weapon, Marcy uh, Jordan, who's a PhD in pharmacologist, really comes into play. Here's where we develop all the deadlines, all the spreadsheets, all the tracking spreadsheets. We have to produce all the components of the application, and we have to do it so that they're consistent across the entire application. If you've got one investigator over at this institution writing a proposal and one over a, a core and one over here writing a project and they're not the same format, the reviewers will notice, <laughs> and they want to be able to see consistency. So maintaining an open and responsive uh, commitment to communication is absolutely critical, particularly in this phase, but all along. Uh, we iteratively create drafts, and I have to rely on somebody creating their draft for their project, and we need to go back and forth, back and forth. And we use lettering systems, so it'll be um, A, version A, and I've gone up to Z, in AA versions <laughs> of drafts. Um, and it goes back to what Jim was saying about writing well and making sure that you're conveying your idea and you're conveying it consistently and synergistically across all of the projects and cores. And in, during this time, we're also um, creating the science at the same time we're doing the budget. So that's going back and forth. And this is a big uh, deadline setting process. We review it every day in the morning. Where are we? And every day in the afternoon when we finish so we can appreciate that where we are. And now, uh, the last time we did one, it was paper. Uh, now it has to be submitted online. And I see Tony sitting over here, because um, I'll mention uh, this in a second. But this is a new world for all of us in terms of putting these huge, uh, there may be, what, 100 PDFs that'll have to be posted, maybe more, all the bio sketches, everything. So that's going to be extremely challenging. This is just an example. This is a spreadsheet for a P50. This is about three months before the deadline. And uh, every single item that needs to be created, and in many cases, most of these are single PDFs ultimately now, um, we keep a, a content uh, document that includes what, what do we need, what's the status of that, what, what are the details, who's the lead on it, so we know who's responsible at any given moment. Uh, there are all sorts of comments that, fa that fall into this category. Uh, what page numbers, when we ultimately start paginating, that's the column for paging, uh, then anything else we need to know about uh, uh, anything else that we're, we're, we're tracking. And it's all color coded. So for this particular week that we were working on this, the, the, what we were working on is in yellow, and these are the pieces that we were putting together. And we go back and forth between each of these items so that they're consistent and they're, they're relaying a message that's consistent. Then there's a whole section on uh, institutional resources. OSP is absolutely critical for helping with this. The IT, uh, ITS and the CTSA is also very helpful. We have to produce a, a, an overall um, theme, as we heard earlier from David. Uh, we have letters of support. There's a pilot core, in this case, with administration. And each one of these has the same components. And so we're tracking it. We're tracking all of the letters. And then each one of the projects, each one of the cores, has uh, uh, all of these documents that have to be produced. So over the last six months, you're narrowing down the funnel into producing all of these and, um, and making sure that they're all consistent across every single one of the, the categories. So this is no small feat of organization. And I'm, I'm really kind of worried the first time we put one of these together and have to uh, post those online. So I'm looking to Tony's group to be able to help that. And in fact, that's, uh, this is a slide that she provided. Assuming uh, OSP is very anxious to help, and they'll provide available assistance. But this is assuming that this uh, process begins early enough. OSP is one of the first things that you, we decide is we're going to do it, and we let OSP know. And then under those circumstances, they can help with reading the guidelines. Sometimes they're, not, um, they're a bit obtuse. They're helpful there. <coughs> Here's Assist is the new system to do it online. 
Uh, they work with the other OSP offices at other collaborating um, uh, institutions for all the COI documentations and the cover pages and the letters of agreement to, uh, to, consult, to co collaborate. They um, develop uh, template languages for all of the pieces and uh, parts, and they assist with the budget. And we use, we use the, their assistance, and it's uh, really helpful in terms of producing the budget. The second piece I wanted to talk about actually relates to um, any kind of grant, but I've, I personally have found, and then I, I'd like to hear from others, that the relationship that you have with the, the entire um, NIH Institute that you're addressing is really, really important. And this is just an example of the organizational chart, and these are typically produced. They're all on every NIH site. This mm -hmm. happens to be the National Institute on Drug Abuse from the director, all of her uh, staff in the, in the main office. And then there are divisions, and in, there, in NIA's case, there's five essential divisions. Each of those divisions is bro broken down into branches, and each branch has a chief, a branch chief. And under those branch chiefs are project officers. And I forget how many that, they, that are at NIDA. There's something like 150 maybe at NIDA. So out of all those project officers, somebody has to be your champion. They have to champion that you're going to send a, 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 pro, a project to them. They have to be the right person with the right fit. They have to be excited about what you're doing. If they're not excited about it, this is way too much trouble. And that takes cultivating a working relationship. They need to know who you are, and they need to know who you are well enough to appreciate and value your input and, uh, uh, into their uh, <coughs> funding portfolio. Um, I, one of the things I make sure <laughs> is to seize every opportunity I have to meet with them, every student, every postdoc, every junior faculty I work with, any other faculty meeting, faculty member that's involved in the project. We make every opportunity to meet them. We talk to these uh, project officers and the division, uh, sometimes the division chiefs and the branch chief, the division directors and the branch chiefs are there. Conferences on the phone, by email, going to Bethesda. and. If they don't know you, how can they help you? And how can they give you? You want to know right up front if your idea is all wrong. You really do want to know up front. And then you can tweak it, or you can help find um, other alternatives to do with it, uh, what to do with the project. Uh, they'll help develop a sound strategy, and it's never the right time to cultivate that relationship when you've already decided to seek an opportunity. You want that relationship to be in place so that you can get honest feedback at the time at which you are seeking the opportunity. And this brings up, uh, we already know that there are a great deal of, of, of skill sets we need. I mean, the base is that we need to have, uh, demonstrate scholarly expertise. We need to be creative and innovative as scientists. We need to have great grant writing skills. We also need to, these relational skills to actually be successful in sponsored research. And by relational skills, it's a horrible sounding term, I know, and, um, and you, you, I think we generally think we don't need to think about these kind of behavioral aspects, but, but the ability to initiate and maintain a relationship with project officers is, is going to determine whether your concept for a P50 or a P01 is a good fit. You met, and Alan mentioned that they actually went to Bethesda to talk to their project officers twice to shape their P01, seeking advice on project design and, and what the funding track might be, uh, ascertaining trains and, uh, trends in the preferred methods, and identifying limits in, in the project itself and target budgets, and of course, approval. They have to approve it if it's over the cap, and in, in the case of P01s and P50s or P60s, they have to approve that they're even going to accept them. The ability to learn by listening to, to the project officer is also a relational skill. I think the best idea, the best thing that's worked uh, in, in my experience is having somebody that will be honest with you. <laughs> Their goal is to build portfolios of research. They are tasked with building those portfolios. Somebody, a project officer that is, is um, how do I say this, not willing to be honest and direct with you may lead you down the line of uh, submitting a proposal of any sort that they're not even interested in because they don't have the format or the shape of it yet. A colleague of mine submitted a grant recently and uh, never checked with a project officer. 
it went in and it was returned three days later uh, in, a, in a university in Illinois. We don't want it. This institute doesn't want it. This institute doesn't want it. This institute doesn't want it. It's dead. She needs to reformat the whole thing and start over. So listening to the project officer and hearing their comments. They hear comments. They know what's going on in study sections. They may not be in the room, but they're usually on the, on the phone listening. And they can help with design and grantsmanship. And so we think, we think about this and success factors, and I've just given you a, a brief overview of some of them. But I'm always struck by how much is hidden. And this was really crystallized for me in this article that um, was published a few years ago. Uh, official materials don't necessarily reflect the considerations that are important for success. So project officers and review panels develop their own preferences and dislikes over time, and those aren't written down anywhere. So being, uh, being on a study section, chairing a study section, listening to what's going on on the phone for a project officer is what helps you understand what a study section wants. In our case, there's a particular behavioral, <coughs> I, I just finished chairing a study section, there's a particular behavioral technique. If you send it to that study section, you're done. You're just done. So how do you know that? You don't know that unless you talk to the SRA, you talk to the project officers, you talk to people on the study sections. So these kinds of things don't find their way into print. Program priorities also shift. Those things are delayed in finding their way into print. And so working with a project officer, a division director, or a branch chief, and being able to get a candid informal response about your research theme is a very good predictor of whether you're going to even get your foot in the door. So um, all of the, you know, the, all of this makes sense in any kind of grant. It really makes sense in these large multi-million dollar grants that they're going to put forth and fund at your institution. You've got to know up front that they, they actually want it. And there's um, a, a litany of questions that you can address to the project officers to actually hopefully elicit an honest response <coughs> about uh, their current priorities may not be what you see printed on the, uh, in the, their website or even uh, talking to other investigators. So asking specifically if your project falls within the current priorities, um, would you, what do you recommend? Uh, what's the proposed success rate actually? They're, they're pretty good at many institutions, uh, in, in many institutes. And um, uh, why might your, uh, a, pr a proposal be rejected? Why would a, what are the common failures for a, a P01 or a P50 that have been seen? So um, I, I know from talking to faculty here and elsewhere that their experiences with project officers are not consistent. And um, if you're lucky, you're able to work through meeting many so that you can actually talk to those that are going to provide the most useful advice. <laughs> um, and that was it. That's all I had to say. So. Thanks. Questions, comments, additions? about relationships. Alan, do you want to add anything to that? It's important. And we ran into the trouble that uh, the program officers turn over pretty quickly. And so we, when we were refunding our PO1, we, we dealt with the turnover of three different program officers in the space of two months. So there was, wow. it, you really had to be on top of that <laughs> uh, in order to generate some interest, but ultimately uh, you do have to have an advocate at the funding agency to, that will support your grant. Budget? The worst, the worst timeline story that I ever participated in was uh, with a pepper. For the first pepper, well we only had, I mean it was, everything worked. You know, I was basically because I had Bob Wolf, so he brought the team, he brought everything. But so everything worked, but I wasn't sure of these people. I hadn't talked about trust, I hadn't known anything about it. So in the timeline that I put out, and this was before days when everyone would know all the timelines, I put out this timeline, except I lied about the due date. <laughs> I, I put the due date a month before it actually was due. Um, and then I said, surprise, and they, they forgave me. But it really, 
Um, it really helped in terms of getting the external review needed and all that stuff. So I'm not advocating Lyme, of course, but it, it worked. So um, David is going to finish up uh, talking a little about uh, budgets. Yeah, I'm not going to uh, talk much longer. I think we talked a lot. We'd like to have an interactive uh, discussion towards the end here, if at all possible. <laughs> Um, budgets, why do you do this? Uh, this can be huge money. It can be a couple million dollars a year. What do you want to get? You want to get every bit of money that they're <laughs> offering for any individual project. Uh, so everything that Dr. Cunningham said about the program officer is absolutely key. You got to identify who's going to fund you. You got to know what the maximum budget is that they're going to fund. If you're going to go over that maximum budget, you've got to get it approved before you go. When do you start developing the budget? When you start developing the grant, years in advance. When do you get OSP to come and help you? At least one year in advance, or they're not going to help you. They, they won't help you unless you give them about a year. The budget should be created at the same time the grant is concocted, the methodologies are being developed. Uh, you got to make sure adequate money is available to accomplish all tasks. Now, like, I, I really want you to know you're going to ask for everything they are willing to give you for this particular RFA. What you want to make sure is you don't lose it at the end. They don't cut programs, and they don't cut cores, and they don't cut major parts of the grant, so you can't get done what you started out with or what you wanted to do. Everybody who is participating in this team has to review the grant budget most of the time. Big key, most of the money shouldn't go to you. It should go to everybody else, not to you, or you're not going to win here. Uh, people aren't going to be vested. Uh, discuss the budget with the funding program director three years in advance two years in advance, one year in advance, have an RFA identified, know how much money you're shooting for. If you have a legitimate reason to go above their maximum, they may well support it. For example, if you do clinical activities, you get another half a million a year. If you're going to support Dr. Powell, you could get a whole million a year. Um, you really can if you've got clinical cores and, and objectives that are are really important to the program and to the uh, NIH, uh, you can get more money for it. You start with a maximum. You work with OSP early. A year in advance is minimum. They're here somewhere hiding, but there I see them. A year is minimum for something this big. Why do you do it? It's a lot of money, a couple million dollars a year. That doesn't end up being much once you divide it amongst everybody else and you're paying for the cores. And Why does the dean want you to do it? Because he can get a couple, the vice president, I'm sorry, I've got to get the nomenclature. But it, it's really important to you and your institution. Direct costs, cost shares, estimated program income, facilities and administration, salaries, wages, fringes, benefits, consultant costs, equipment, supplies, all of this has to be put in that timeline that Dr. Cunningham was talking about uh, very, very early. The, any of the budgets, if you're not going to lose them, have to be extremely well justified and reasonable. But why do you do this? You can get administrative and clerical support. You can get shared resources and services that are intended to prov provide new technologies to enhance productivity and services. They will pay for big stuff that will make big advances possible. Costs associated with sharing data and sending it out to the scientific community can be requested. And if you don't request them, you're wrong because if you can't prove that you can analyze the data and share the data with the rest of the world, your grant probably won't be accepted. Uh, cost used for ad hoc scientific and technical consultants can be paid for. Seminars to promote interdisciplinary interaction and education can be supported. Uh, cost centers, um, external advisory boards can be paid for. Travel of investigators to scientific meetings, particularly if you've got multi-institutional components to your grants, 
they're essential to the contact and to the, to the success of this kind of activity. We can't find that money anywhere. We can't get this kind of money through any other mechanism. It is really worth it. Go for the maximum. Get the maximum. Don't let any of your projects be duds because they'll cut them at the end and you'll lose the money. Don't let any of your cores be duds. They'll cut and you'll lose the money. Go for the maximum, but make sure you're going to get the maximum. Make sure it's all gold. Personnel, supply, equipment, I'm not going to talk about the details. I just wanted to get the idea. Work with the OSP. They really are great people if they see money. <laughs> and that means you're going to get it. If you're not going to get it, they don't want to spend the time. Thanks a lot. And uh, this should be interactive. Uh, it should. It should. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one, I think one overall message, because, you know, we've been saying it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. It's hard, it's hard. Leadership, leadership. You've got to remember the funding rates, okay? Remember that slide I had on the funding rates compared to the R01. So for those of you who plan on being around for the next five years, you know, and especially junior people who are not capable of writing one of these right now or leading one of these, but if you're going in for a career, you know, this is what you have to start thinking about the five years you want to put one in. Or, or, or whatever. Uh, and so, why do you do it? The money, the infrastructure, but also, you know, if you, if you go through all of that work, most people fall on the side. But if you make it, the funding rates are really quite extraordinary. 33%, 40% of these applications for the, for the people who can finally get it together are funded. So that's a, that's a real good reason to work hard over a long period of time to do it. And, and some of these RFAs that come out where everyone has to scurry around and put them together in five or six months, I'm sure we have all been on study sections to look at those. I was on a bunch of NCI. You know, you, you're looking at these P50 grants and you're reading halfway through and then there'll be this line saying, and need more, need more data here, you know, like maybe both. So like, you're not necessarily competing. I mean, you know, I mean, even though, even though you've been getting up at 2 a.m. For, for, you know, 50 or 60 consecutive days to do it, um, that's worth it in terms of getting everything uh, polished. Are there questions uh, that uh, people would like to um, get further information about? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, in one of your earlier statements, you said it's very important to anticipate announcement. So basically, you have to make some sort of a prediction what the NOH wants to have, let's say, one or two or five years from now, right? Because you have to start early. The question is how. Yeah, well, that, that gets back to. How can you accomplish this? Absolutely. Uh, like contacting maybe program officers, but uh, you have some sort of. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Supernatural. <laughs> no, 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 stop, okay, no, you've asked enough, no, uh, it's a good question, but it can be a short question, um, so it gets to what Catherine was saying about cultivating, it also, uh, NIH is getting more transparent now in terms of, you know, with their blogs from their, you know, directors and all that stuff, and so they'll, They'll come out now, an institute will come out now and say, worth, we think we're going to put in, uh, you know, we're going to start new center grants in, in, in six months or nine months. You can get it from that, but mostly you get it from networking. Uh, because when, you know, when an institute is trying to decide a new center, then it has lots of, uh, it has lots of uh, consultants, outside consultants, inside consultants. Uh, they take it to their... They, they take it to their advisory boards, things like that. For the old centers, you know, you just say, well, you know, there are these pepper centers, and every, every year and a half or so, there's a new RFA for them. And so, you know, you can know that. You can do freedom of information and get copies of the old grants, right, things like that. So uh, it's a lot of networking and anticipation, but, but it's, not, uh, it's not magic. Don. Jim, I, I think 
I'd like to add to that that you can get a lot of information by serving on study sections. And if you already have, say, a Pepper Center grant, uh, volunteering to serve on the review sections, uh, sessions for the new uh, renewals when it's not yours, those you learn an amazing amount by periodically being in Bethesda, talking with all the people that are involved. And that's a really good reason to be on a study section. A lot of hard work, takes a lot of time. But if you have, if you have the ambition to do one of these big projects, it's invaluable. It, it once again gets back to what Catherine said about networking. You, you know, when you're on that study section, especially the ones that are held in Bethesda, the POs are wandering in and out often. Uh, so it is a wonderful opportunity. So you are proposing the study sections where the program projects are reviewed, or the peak grants are reviewed, not the R01 type of study sections? No, I mean, the R01, so the question was, you know, what study sections? I, I think any study section, I mean, you're in an R01 study section, you just could be meeting a lot of other people like you that are relatively high powered, plus you're, you know, plus you're meeting the program officers, and there's just a lot of gossip, you know, when you're there overnight, and there's just a lot of what's happening here, what's happening there, it's just all networking. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, and in fact, in a couple of study sessions they, that I've been on, they actually review R01s and PO1s in the same study session which is not a good idea because people get confused about the mechanism and I don't think the reviews are as good for a PO1 in those circumstances, but they can, it can happen. But they're, spe they're usually specials for uh, the P's, the P50s, 30s, um, and those are the really, really good things to, to do for anybody that wants to. Once the program officers know that you're spending this five or ten years trying to develop, pro develop program project grants, they do put you on study sections to uh, um, great other program project grants and don't ever turn that down if you're asked. It's, it's almost a calling card or a necessary, uh, a necessary chip to get in the game. There are also, one thing that's, they're, they're all um, institute directed, so they're not CSR study sessions. So they're all, um, except for, uh, is CSR do the, um, No, these are for the NIAD, these are all NIAD special. Yeah. They're all special, so the chances are you're going to be connected to all those, a lot of the people that are reviewing it, so you want them to have, help you hold your program in high regard to. But I think we would all agree, all agree, for any investigator, it's a real good idea to be on a study section. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, so currently I have an MPI R1, and I have some junior faculty that are on it. One of them has since gotten an R01, so tell me, Strategically, when is a good time to grow that into something bigger, or do you need to renew the R01, or what's some advice with that particular situation? And when is it, when you have enough mid to senior level personnel to go for a program project? More than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you know, you're beginning, you're beginning to, you got two people with R01s that are on similar top, that's great. Then uh, maybe you should think not about growing more junior investigators, which is good too. Uh, maybe it's about getting another R01, right? Getting your second R01 or getting an R01 together. It's about finding other people that you can, you know, now that you have two people doing research that are funded, you know, it, it's about other other people at the university that aren't doing what you're doing, but somehow what they're doing is relevant. That's where the real interdisciplinary comes in, right? And, and starting to talk into that. Alan, do you have anything? Yeah, most program projects, the, they're capped at a million per year. And uh, so you, you know, with the core administrative I think uh, now funding, and most you're going to be able to fund recently is three uh, projects, sometimes four. But each one of those projects has to be based on Investigator, and then also be highly interactive and synergistic, and so on. So, you're really talking three to four components for a program. Yeah. Do they allow modular budgets? What? Do they allow modular budgets? Yeah. No. No. Yeah. And do your team members have to be all like from the team or is no. it good to have them outside of other external? You have to be convincing that you right. interact a lot. Right. It's and not good to be from outside, but they don't yeah. have to be from outside. Okay. Yeah. They can be from Houston. Right. 
Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they can be from other places, but it, you know, it's it, you real you really then have to, Go you know, the here's one. our here's here's our video here's our weekly video conference and, okay. and stuff like that, and show those publications like right. Alan said. But I mean, sometimes that's the only way you're going to do it, right? And then hopefully it's going to be in Houston. Yeah. There's some mechanisms that insist on that. There's an alcohol right. NIAAA one in India, and they have to be from multiple yeah. places in the country. Okay. So you have to reach out to get something like that. But right. that's unusual. That's and unusual. So you really yeah. want to need to make sure. Questions? Yes, Don. A comment, Don. I wanted to emphasize what you said about having an innovative idea. You said they sing, you said it's a book. There are different ways to describe it, but those of us that have been in this game a long time know it when we see it. Exactly. There has to be an innovative idea. It's got to really grab people. If it doesn't, no matter how well you organize it or how well you write it, you're not likely to get funded. So. Just remember that. You can have all of the components, but if you don't have the idea, and it's got to be an innovative idea, then you're, you're going to be in trouble. That's a good way to stop. Thank you all for coming. Thanks.